first derivative things. Let's just recap in two lines from Friday. If f prime is positive, f is increasing. Yeah. And if f prime is negative, that means the slope is negative. You're going down. f is decreasing. And if f prime equals 0, or if f prime is undefined, then it's a critical number or a critical value. OK, that's the Friday's notes in, in three lines. New thing today is the first derivative test. Tomorrow we'll talk about the second derivative test, or Wednesday, or whenever I see you next. Um, yeah, I think it's Wednesday. And we did not label the, the calendar this way, um, because in the past we would label these days as first derivative test, and the next day would be second derivative test, and students would see that and think, what, we have a test already and it's on back-to-back -back days? And no, it's not like a test like we're going to you know, take a summative assignment. It's a test to see for maximums and minimums. If f prime, here's the first derivative test, and we, we kind of already used it on that last example from number seven. If f prime changes from negative to positive, at x equals c, we need a spot to talk about. If f prime changes from negative to positive, then f has a, so this is not one of those memorized things. This is one of those think about it things. If f prime, the slope of f, changes from negative to positive, then what's happening to f? Decreasing to increasing. It's going from decreasing to increasing. Relative extreme. So there's a relative extrema, but be more specific, which extrema is it? A minimum has a relative minimum at x equals c. Again, this is not something you want to like put on a note card and memorize. And no, you think about what f prime means, and then you can figure out the rest. You can guess the second part. If f prime changes from positive to negative, at x equals c, again, don't memorize. Read. Think about what it means. f prime, so that's the slope of f, goes from positive to negative, so f is going from increasing to decreasing, that means f has a relative maximum. At x equals c. You see that and you're like, well, that, that seems to make sense. Like, that's not anything crazy there. Um, you know, it sounds official, the first derivative test, but it's just 
if you know what f prime means, then it, it follows pretty easily, I think. All right, some examples of how we how we use this and things we ask. Let's find all relative extrema. So extrema would be minimums and maximums. Find all relative extrema. You know what? Let's add this. Relative extrema points, meaning I don't just want the x value. You'll need to give the y value as well since it says points. of f of x equals x to the fourth minus 32x plus 4. And designate whether it's a max or a min. Thank you. You know, in the process of working this problem, you could conceivably get all the extrema points without telling which which they are. If you work the problem completely and fully like we're going to do, you're going to know if it's a max or a min, but you could sneak your way into an answer without giving that final answer there. Okay, so potential maximums and minimums come from the set of critical points. So let's find the critical points first by finding the the derivative, the first derivative. So 4x cubed minus 32. We'll set that equal to 0. Uh, it's never undefined, but remember you always have to think about that. So most of them you don't have to worry about it, but because we're not in the habit of looking for the undefined ones, sometimes we forget. Factor out of 4. So x equals 2. That's our only critical point. So that's the only possible max or min we can have. So let's put, let's do a number line, 2, and I want to check, or I want to find f prime of uh, something less than 2 and then something more than 2, because that will tell us increasing, decreasing. 1 and 3? Um, 1 and 3 would work? I'm going to go 0 and 3. 1 and 3 would be fine. But zero would be a little bit easier. Um, let's see. It's not factored, but it doesn't need to be factored. Um, I could use either format of this, but plugging in zero is going to be easy enough. I think I'm going to use the, the factored form. So, I mean, all it does is pull out the four. But so four times negative eight is negative thirty-two. Remember, all we care about is positive negative, so the fact that the 32 doesn't really matter, but the negative definitely matters. So if f prime is negative, what does that tell me about f? It's decreasing. Right, f prime of 3, 4 times 3 cubed, 27 minus 8. Okay, here's where we want to use the fact that all we really care about is positives and negatives. So what's 4 times 27 minus 8? 66, apparently. I don't know. It's positive. I mean, I just did it, so. so that means f is increasing over there. Now, some people are good enough here, they're, probably most of you, to say, well, if f prime changes negative to positive, we know what that means. Other people, if you're more visual, you want to kind of draw it out. F goes from decreasing to increasing. Then it's 
it's really hard to miss what's going on here. What's happening at x equals 2? A relative minimum. So you can draw it out with you know, a rough sketch of the graph, or you can just see that f prime changes negative to positive. Either way, there's a relative minimum at x equals 2. But let's say y. And the y is the first derivative test. You don't have to reference the first derivative test. You have to use the first derivative test. And so your reason is f prime changes negative to positive. You're going to use that justification quite a few times all year long. Goody. F prime changes negative to positive or positive to negative because that will be your max or your min. Let's go. If go ahead. There's only one relative extremum, mm -hmm. and you plug in zero and it's negative, can't you just assume that anything above two would be positive? No, because you can have, because I don't know at this stage, before we did all that, I did not know that x equals 2 is an extrema. All I know is that x equals 2 is a critical point, which means it might be an extrema. So it's asking you to find relative extrema. It might be an extrema, but it might just be... Nothing. Correct. The, the easy example of that is x cubed. x cubed has a critical point at x equals 0, f prime equals 0, at x equals 0. It flattens out, but that's not a max or a min. Yeah. So just because it's a critical point doesn't mean it's a max or min. Just because it's a rectangle doesn't mean it's a square. Possibly. You, if it didn't, you would just say there are no relative extrema because f prime never changes signs. Like you would end up with a chart on this one. You would just have f prime being positive, positive. And so there wouldn't be any extrema. Now, you'd be doing that without the graph, so you wouldn't really know. But if f prime doesn't change signs, then it never changes one way or the other. Uh, reread the question to make sure we get this. Find all relative extrema. We did that. Points. Points. Oh, we don't have a point yet. What do I need to do to get a point? Plug it in. Yeah, plug it in. So I need um, the point. F of 2. So that would be 2 to the 4th minus 32 times 4 plus 4. 32 times 2. Oh, you're right, 32 times 2. So the relative min is at 2, comma. And then if I wanted to be uh, lazy or efficient, I could just write all of that right here rather than risk messing it up. Let's see, 2 to the 4th is, I'm going to risk messing it up, though, 16 minus 64 plus 4. So 16 minus 64 is negative 48 plus 4 is negative 44. Uh, if it was me, I probably wouldn't have done all that. I would have just left it all like that and walked away. So not, not risking this thing. Example two. Check and see what time we get out of here. Oh, we're good on time. Find all values of x where y equals. <coughs> Thank you x plus 2 sine x has 
a local min or max on 0 to 2 pi. And all values of x, or y equals x plus 2 sine x, as a local min or max on 0 to 2 pi. This is almost the same as the last question, worded a little differently. Do you see any, other than the, I mean, the, the equation is different, the function is different, but do you see anything in how it asks the question that's different than the, the previous one? Values, not points. Yeah, it, x values, not points. So that's one step easier. It's not a hard step that they omitted. But it's one step easier. I don't have to find the y values. So if I'm looking for maxes and mins, then I need to find critical points, put them on a number line, and see if we get any of the changes. So first derivative, 1 plus 2, derivative of sine is cosine. Set that equal to 0. To find the critical points, and then you put the critical points on a number line to see if there's any maxes or mins. So cosine of x equals negative one half. Unit circle. It's one of those two, three, three. So cosine is negative one half at the. Negative would be on the left, so the steep angles on the left would be 2 pi over 3 and 4 pi over 3. And I have to say 4 pi over 3, not negative 2 pi over 3, because it specifies 0 to 2 pi. All right, so those are my critical points. Those are my potential maxes and mins, but I don't really know what's going on until I do a number line and do the first derivative test. So you have to get something in between there? Something in between there. Pi. Pi, yes. So let's find f prime of pi, f prime of, I'll go 0. 0 is on the interval. It's at the end of the interval, so we have to be a little bit careful. But it didn't show up as a, um, as a critical point, so I'm OK using 0. And then I think I would just use 2 pi at the other end, kind of the same reason. It's the end point, which is dangerous, but it was not critical number, so I don't have to worry about that. So let's plug those in and see what happens. 1 plus 2 cosine 0. Uh, cosine of 0 is... Cosine of 0 is... I almost have to draw the picture here. Cosine of 0 is 1. 1 plus 2 is 3. So f prime is positive, uh, f is increasing. What I really need to see is that f prime is positive. If you, if you want to say f is increasing, if you want to draw an, an up arrow to help your brain visualize what's going on, you can do that. But f prime being positive is what we really want to see. f prime at pi, 1 plus 2 cosine pi. Cosine of pi, see that's on the other end, so that's negative 1. 1 minus 2 is negative 1. So f prime is negative. That's enough. You can stop right there. My brain keeps thinking, though, and says, well, that means f is decreasing, and that means the function is going down, and that means I found me a maximum right there. Yes, but I need to do the last one. f prime of 2 pi. 1 plus 2 cosine 2 pi. Cosine of 2 pi and cosine of 0 are the same. So I know this is positive. So that means 
f is increasing, my function's going up, if you need to see a picture of it. So there's a relative max at x equals 2 pi over 3. Oh, I didn't say justify your answer. I should have. If I didn't say justify, this would be good enough. But since I just added justify, I need to add the justification. And the justification is going to be f prime changes positive to negative. That's part of my answer. And then there's a relative min. At x equals 4 pi over 3. Because f prime changes negative to positive. Again, the main thing that... I'm looking for and that AP will be looking for will be the F prime. But most of the time students take it another step or two to really clarify in their brain, you know, what's going on. Okay, that's first derivative stuff. We're about to move to second derivative stuff, but let's pause for a minute. And make sure we're good with first derivative stuff. Okay. First derivative stuff, I think, by itself is not hard. It gets confusing when we start throwing in second derivative stuff. And I mean, all of it comes from that. F prime is positive. F is increasing. F prime is negative, F is decreasing. If you know the derivative means slope, then you know that, and then you know the rest of this stuff. So first derivative tells you slope. I said that a hundred times probably. If you know that, then the rest of this, I think, I hope, makes sense. Questions, comments, concerns, concerns observations. Complaints. All right, let's talk about second derivative things. And those things are concavity and inflection points. Cavity and inflection points. Well, just like first derivative tells you slope, Second derivative tells you concavity and inflection points. Or tells you concavity, and when it changes, there's an inflection point. So let, let's talk about visually, like just looking at a graph first, what concave down and concave up mean, and then we'll, we'll worry about second derivatives. Um, concave down. I learned this little silly saying this way. Concave down. looks like a frown, down in frown.
concave up. Need something to rhyme with up. That's bold up. Looks like a cup. Down frown, up cup. So concave down looks like a frowny. I, what's a sad color? Sad color would be blue. Mm. So I need to see where this thing looks like a frown. So over here it looks like a cup. It's, it's bold up. Somewhere in here, maybe right about there, it changes. Not increasing to decreasing, but change from being bold up to being bold down. Change from being a cup to being a frown. So that's an inflection? That's an inflection point. We hadn't used that word yet, though. Concave down, concave down. We're frowning all the way till we get to over here, that similar point where it changes from a, a frown to a cup. Well, at that cusp, it's a good question, but the, the concavity doesn't change. It's concave down on both sides, so it's not an inflection point. Again, kind of jumping ahead there. Concave up, I guess we could be orange. Orange seems positive, maybe, happy. I used to have pink, but I can't find the pink anymore. Maybe someone stole it. Someone swiped the pink. Okay, so visually concavity isn't really that hard to figure out. Like if it's if it's bold up, if it's a cup, it's concave up. If it's bold down, it's concave down. Um, a little bit of a trick though on the frown and cup thing is another example of concave down would be something like that. And some people are like, well, that's not a frown. And you're like, well, it's half of a frown. You look upset. It's it's concave down. It's not. Uh, you know, water would run off of it. Same thing with a cup. If you had half of a cup, that's concave up, even though it's not a full cup. It wouldn't hold water because you don't have the full cup, but it's still concave up. So any of these little rhymey things are tricky there's always because there's like little exceptions that make it not quite, make the make the rhymey thing not quite work. Like I'm free except I've received. Point of inflection. Which you can from now on abbreviate as POI. And that is definitely a universally accepted abbreviation. So an AP test, you can definitely write that POI and they'll know exactly what you're talking about. In my in my uh, in the calculus teacher Facebook group. I don't know, once a month, some teacher posts some new abbreviation that they think they should be able to use. And usually, the main people are like, no, we've never heard of that. Don't do that. But POI, people know what POI is. That's point of inflection. And that happens when concavity changes. So those little red stars are points of inflection because the concavity changed. And so it's a good time to look at that cusp. Something weird is going on at the cusp. Um, what's what's the first derivative at the cusp? It's not, it's not zero. Undefined. It's undefined because it's a cusp. But there's not a point of inflection there because the it's concave down the whole way. So be careful. That's first derivative versus second derivative. Um, I didn't plan this out ahead of time well enough. For concave down, here's something else we can say about concave down. The tangent lines are above. If we drew any tangent lines to our curve, they're above. For 
concave down. Tangent lines are below the curve. That's another one where I, I don't memorize that, and every year I hit it, I have to think about it. But if you think about it and draw the picture, it's like, oh yeah, the tangent lines are all above, tangent lines are all below. So that's another one where I would not memorize that. I would know what it's talking about, and you can figure it out when you need it. Okay, so that's the sort of the, the visual um, discussion of concavity. Uh, what do we say? The analytic or the calculus definition of concavity? F is concave down. We'll go in the same order here. F is concave down. when f prime is decreasing. When f prime is decreasing, when the slope is getting less. So you look at our, um, our picture, the concave down picture, that slope is getting less. It's still positive, it's getting less. If we had continued it, it would, the slopes would go negative, which would mean they're getting less. So f is concave down when f prime is decreasing, when the slopes are decreasing. I hope you have room. We're going to put something else at the end of that line in a moment. But let's talk about concave up. f is concave up when f prime is, well, what do you think? Increasing. Increasing. And again, you can look at the picture and see that, even if we did the full cup there. Those slopes, negative, less negative, positive, more positive, those slopes are increasing. And then if, if f prime is decreasing, that means decreasing means its, its prime is negative. So this means f prime prime is negative. f prime increasing, that means f prime prime, the slope of f prime is positive. That last one is usually what we what we use most. Let's just restate that here. If f double prime, uh, we'll keep going in the same order. If f double prime is less than zero, f is concave down. If f double prime is greater than zero, f is concave up. And if f prime changes signs, if f double prime changes signs, so that means the concavity is changing, that's a point of inflection. So there's some parallel stuff going on here. If f prime is negative, that means decreasing. But if f double prime is negative, that means concave down. So this is where things start to get confusing because you got the first derivative set of rules and the second derivative set of rules. And some of the if statements are really similar. Like, is it positive? Is it negative? Is it changing? But the then statements, the conclusions, are what is different.
the process is pretty darn close to the same in terms of take a derivative, take a second derivative, set it equal to zero. Good, we got four minutes left. Let's let's do one example. f of x equals negative x cubed plus 6x squared minus 9x minus 1. Try to abbreviate this problem. Let's find concavity intervals and POI. It's kind of the same question because you need the second derivative for both of them. So first derivative, negative 3x squared plus 12x minus 9. So if it asked first derivative stuff, we'd stop there. We'd factor it. We'd be thinking about increasing and decreasing and maximums and minimums. But this isn't first derivative question. This is a second derivative question. Second derivative negative 6x plus 12. So let's set that equal to 0. So x equals 2. And, and this is why we like to do these things on the same day, because the process is the same. Set it equal to 0, put it on a number line, test the intervals, now, your conclusions are different because you're either talking increasing, decreasing, or concavity, but the process is the same. So let's find second derivative at 0, second derivative at 3. We'll skip ahead. The second derivative at 0 is positive. The second derivative at 3 is negative. So that means we're concave up from negative infinity to 2 concave down from 2 to infinity. And concavity changed it to, so there's a point of inflection at x equals 2. All right, next time I see you is Wednesday, so I hope you have a chance to look at worksheet 2, 8 through 16. That's first derivative stuff. And worksheet 3, 1 through 8. Worksheet 2, the rest of it. Worksheet 3, 1 through 8. Oh, I don't know if they will. I don't know if they will. Um, I will look and see if I can find them and post them. <laughs>